Hi again then guys and welcome to another installment of the Beards and Cars podcast and for those who incidentally like to listen to this in its audio only form you can jump on the link down below to go over to the SoundCloud page for this channel and listen to that version. For now however the video version is definitely more beneficial for the channel and it's easier to have a discussion of course about your thoughts down in the comments here than it is over there. If nothing else because there are more people here in the comments than on SoundCloud. Now this topic is one of our more conceptual ones. It's less about top 10 best or top 10 worst or what I don't like about this this week or what I do like about that which of course is what a lot of these episodes are. This one is more a topic which is very much open-ended. There are a number of variables, some of which I'll go into, and doubtless you'll bring up your ideas down below as well. And of course that topic is what makes a racing game, or arguably in the wider sense a driving game, successful. There are many variables, for sure, and as I said, I'm sure you do have your own thoughts there, maybe some of you come from a background that's even involved in gaming, perhaps, so you will have a unique perspective there. From my perspective, as a consumer and a content creator, but not a game creator, my thoughts on this fall down two very specific routes. Two things that I would say make a racing game successful, or at least give it a very, very good chance of being successful. And I'm actually going to expand those two things into a third one as well, because the third one is very easy to underestimate, but is hugely important. Now, the two in particular are these. Number one is to create a game, a racing game, that nobody else has done. In turn, you are catering to a market which does not have a dominant force. That will give you a strong chance of being a good racing game. That is what Gran Turismo did. Back in 1997 with the first game, Kaz and his crew made a game that other people might have been thinking about, but that nobody had really done. A game that was far more expansive, was trying to be a more professional approach, a self-serious approach to racing rather than a pure arcade game, as most other racing games were, and a game which had the kind of expansive nature that nothing else on the market had, with the sheer volume of cars, tuning, tracks, and good graphics. For the time, of course. That is one way to success, because if you can monopolize a market, it's a good chance that you will do well out of it, at least if it's something that people want. And that, of course, is simple supply and demand. That method, I would argue, is by far the best. Because if you can enter a market that has high demand, but doesn't have many, if any, competitors, well, anyone who comes from a business background will agree with me in saying that that really is a sweet spot to be in. It's the perfect spot to be in, in fact, because it's a recipe for success. You'd really have to try hard to mess that up. The second way, which is a very viable one, but a much more challenging one, is to take on a market that already has competitors, maybe even a dominant force, and try to do what they're doing better than them. That is the second way. But as it suggests and implies, that is a very challenging route to go down. And we can actually see some examples of games that have tried to do that and failed. There are some who you could have argued have success, or you could still argue have success. AC and Project Cars, I would argue, are games which have not fully gone into, you know, rivaling Forzas and Gran Turismos, but they've kind of done a combination of both. They've carved out their own place in the pure sim side of the market, but at the same time, they very clearly have their sights set on becoming bigger contenders in that world. And that is also a very good way of approaching it. If you start by entering the market in a way that is a little bit more niched, gaining a following there and then expanding outward. That's also a very good game plan, and that's what both of those are apparently doing, or so it would seem. However, the option of taking on an existing franchise and trying to outdo them is a very difficult one, especially when the existing franchise or series is already very well established and very good. I would argue that an example of that is Enthusia on the PS2. Enthusia is a cult favorite racing game but there are so many people who have never played it. There are some people who have never even heard of it. Some people who have never seen it. And unfortunately, that's probably the way it's going to stay, for the most part. Now, I would actually love to do Forza content on the channel, but of course it's on the PS2 and I've had issues with recording that in the past. 
It is still definitely something I need to get round to though, because there are so many PS2 games that I want to do content for. But as far as Enthusia goes, I would argue, and I believe I might have said this before, that Enthusia is the most direct rival Gran Turismo has ever had. And there are some people who are thinking, well, wait a second, surely Forza is. It's got a similar amount of games, it's a similar size, they're aiming for the same stuff, so many cars, so many tracks, the graphics, the community, and everyone argues Gran Turismo versus Forza. It's the Mitsubishi Evo versus Subaru and Pretza of the gaming world, or the Viper versus Corvette, or the Ford versus Ferrari. Actually, no, it's not. Because, of course, I did an entire video about why that entire discussion is dumb anyway, but the single core reason why it's dumb is because they simply are not rivals. And I know that comes as a really shocking statement to make, because they certainly seem to be, but they're not. It's as simple as that. In order for them to be rivals, one simple thing would need to happen. They'd need to be on the same console. And they're not. Xbox players are not going to buy Gran Turismo anyway because they have an Xbox, <laughs> so they're not rivals. As I said, the only way that they would be is if Gran Turismo came out on an Xbox or if Forza came out on a PlayStation, and we all know that is not going to happen, because both of those franchises are worth far too much to their respective consoles for them to ever do any kind of crossover like that, because it would undermine both of them. So, they are not rivals. They are simply alternatives, and that is really all they are. Forza is the Gran Turismo of Xbox, Gran Turismo is the Forza of PlayStation. It's as simple as that. Everyone loves to compare them, but it's kind of like comparing a, a Mitsubishi Evo to a Kawasaki Ninja. They're just not designed to be in the same market. They're both fast, they're both great, they're both really good value. But one's a car and one's a motorbike. They have no rivalry. Likewise with Forza and Gran Turismo, neither of them are better because they're not in the same market. They're completely different consoles. So, what's the difference there? Because you could argue, well, surely Forza tried to take on Gran Turismo and its own game. Well, actually, no. Because if you think about it, they did exactly what Gran Turismo did. They looked at the market, they looked at what nobody else was doing, and they did it. And they did it well. And they gained success from it. Gran Turismo looked at the PlayStation side of things, nobody was doing it, they filled the gap. Forza did the same thing, but for the Xbox instead. They looked at the market, what was there? Test Drive Unlimited maybe, maybe Project Gotham, and that's about it. So they filled the niche and the void in the market, and they became successful because of it. So actually, Forza and Gran Turismo are just as successful for the exact same reason. To go back to Enthusia, on the other hand though, that game was in more of an unfortunate position, unfortunately, <laughs> because it didn't come out on an Xbox. It didn't come out on a GameCube or something like that. It came out very specifically on a PS2, and also, even more unfortunately for Enthusia, it came out at the same time roughly as Gran Turismo 4. That is a juggernaut to go up against. I would still argue Gran Turismo 4 is the strongest all-round game in the series, and there are a variety of thoughts back and forth on that. One of the reasons why I argue that is because if you consider its size for the time it came out on the console that it came out on and the amount of content that's in the game, it's massive. It's incredible for its time. Enthusia is a great game. There are a number of cars which Gran Turismo has still never had. Even Dower is in that game, or Door, the door in an EB110 Bugatti. There are a number of cars which are not in Gran Turismo that are in Enthusia, the smart car, the Saab models, various others too. But the problem is, it was so similar to Gran Turismo. It was a game that took the graphics and the physics side of things very seriously. It was all about the circuit racing, all about having a ton of cars, a ton of tracks, very professional racing. I mean, that was even the tagline of the game. And the problem is, it took on Gran Turismo. It was on the same console, catering to the exact same audience. And that is a problem that something like Test Drive Unlimited, or Need for Speed, or Midnight Club, they never come up against that problem, because they're nothing like Gran Turismo. So the people who want that side of things, the more arcade, street racing stuff, they're not buying Gran Turismo anyway. So there is no rivalry there. For Enthusia, though, they're going straight up against Gran Turismo head-on, and they failed because of it. Now, I would argue 
if we changed the outcome of time and you were to tell those guys at, I believe it's Sega, I think, who were behind Enthusia. It was either Sega or Atari, but I think it was Sega. I think Atari was behind Test Drive Unlimited, if I recall correctly, but whichever. If you were to go back and tell those guys, don't make this game now. Wait a decade and make it on a PS4 instead. Imagine if Enthusia in a more current form, maybe with less cars, but with the same essential game, came out on a PS4 at the same time or just after Gran Turismo Sport came out. Imagine what the difference would have been for the Enthusia game compared to what it was. Because what that game offered was nothing compared to GT4 at the time. But what it offered compared to GT Sport now is actually surprisingly impressive. So that taking on of a rival is a very risky route to go down, simply because you have to be absolutely certain of two things. You need to be absolutely certain that you can do what they're doing better, and the second one is much more difficult to overcome, and that is you need to be at least very certain, very certain, kind of contradictory, you, <laughs> you need to be very confident, let's say, that a ton of people who would otherwise buy Gran Turismo will even give your game a chance, let alone love it. And unfortunately, that just didn't happen, for those exact reasons. Everyone already had that base covered with Gran Turismo, so they didn't need Enthusia, which is why so few people play the game, so few people love the game. Those who do play it do tend to like it, though, because it does have those similar core values to Gran Turismo. In some ways, it's not as in-depth, but it's certainly Gran Turismo's biggest rival on the PlayStation, as far as I'm concerned. So I would argue that those two routes are easily the two main ways of making a racing game successful, making it timeless, making it in somebody's top 10. You need to either go down the really ideal route, the perfect route, you could argue, of making a game that nobody else is catering for, and that doesn't necessarily mean that nobody on the market is catering for it, it could simply mean that nobody on the console that you're going for is catering for it. That alone can make all the difference, and it did for Forza. On the other hand, you have the much more challenging route, and unfortunately for most game developers, the second route is almost dominant these days, because there are so many markets and types of driving and racing game that are already covered, that finding a niche is very difficult. And an even more difficult thing is, if you do find a niche, why is it still a niche? Chances are because people don't care that much. So finding a niche which will also be successful is a pretty big challenge. Now, I mentioned early on in the video that there was a third very significant variable that I believe both of the preceding ones are also slave to, and that is simply marketing. And I will categorize marketing as everything from straightforward ad advertising, word of mouth, that kind of stuff, all the way up to reviews from YouTube channels, individuals, even again, word of mouth between friends, or a gaming magazine or gaming site. Do not underestimate the power of marketing. Marketing is everything. Marketing is everywhere. Your favorite racing team colors, it's marketing. Your favorite brand sponsor, it's marketing. Your favorite YouTubers, their merch, it's marketing. Everything is marketing. Liveries, stickers, all of that stuff. Even game reviews are more often than not part of the marketing system because the whole idea is to get the word out more, to get people talking about it, hopefully to get people enjoying it, and for people to tell other people, hey, you should check this out because I loved it and you might too. That is the whole purpose of the marketing system. And that, unfortunately, is the final colossal hurdle that any racing game must really get over because marketing and word of mouth is something that is the most rogue variable of all three. It's quite easy to identify a slot in the market that nobody's doing and to try and cater for it. That's a relatively simple equation to do. It's also even simpler, I would say, from an on-paper point of view, to try and outdo somebody who's already catering to an audience. Because the reason why it's so simple is because, in effect, they're like a pace setter for you. You can look at what they've done, pick out all the best stuff, and don't do all the stuff that they failed at. So on paper, the game plan could seem very, very simple. Just outdo them at what they're not doing well. The marketing, though, that's the one that's difficult, because 
There are so many variables in there, so many people who might just hate on a game for the sake of it, or give a bad review because you didn't pay them, or maybe you couldn't afford a marketing campaign with billboards and trailers, you just don't have the budget, maybe. Or maybe for whatever reason the word of mouth just doesn't get out there. Look at Unsung Heroes, the series on this channel. How many cars in that series are so good, yet for whatever reason they're just forgotten? Even the ones that didn't fail, they're just forgotten. The LeBlanc Mirabal, recently on the channel. Fantastic supercar, Koenigsegg engine, great performance, one of the fastest supercars that most people have never heard of. Was it a failure? No, absolutely not. It's one of the very few true Le Mans prototypes for the street. So why on earth would it be <laughs> an unsung hero? And yet it is, because unfortunately, the variable of marketing is a powerful variable, and it's where many games do fall on the hurdle. And I think that's a shame, because there are so many games that maybe do have a great idea, but didn't have the marketing that just go downhill fast. Now, most of the games that most of us tend to love have had a pretty good marketing campaign. Maybe not with straight up advertising, but usually with word of mouth. Or murder of mouth, <laughs> whichever you'd prefer. Uh, an example of that could even be something like the aforementioned Enthusia. It's a game which did, for all intents and purposes, fail. It tried to take on Gran Turismo, couldn't, and didn't get the sales. However, now, well over a decade later, almost two decades later even, it's actually gotten, you could say, more of a fervent fan base than it ever had back in the day. And this is an interesting phenomenon that tends to happen more, for whatever reasons, to movies than it does to games. I'm sure you can think, if you're a movie fan, of certain movies that came out back in the day that did not get the success that they deserved, maybe they didn't have the marketing, more often than not they're lower budget productions, maybe independent filmmakers, and yet they have these cult status fans who love them. My favourite movie of all time is exactly like that, John Carpenter's The Thing. It was an absolute failure when it came out because it took on E.T. and lost miserably. However, I would say it's a much better film. Of course that's subjective because one is a, <laughs> a coming-of-age family-friendly alien film and the other is a horror. But that point can certainly apply to racing games as well because Enthusia is that perfect example, a game which was not successful, but which has a small and fervent fan group who now think it's really good and love to play it, and love to talk about it. An unsung hero, if you will, of the gaming world. So overall, that's it for my thoughts on what makes a racing game successful, or at least the recipe of what can make a racing game successful. And as I said, there are a number of other variables, but those are definitely the big three that I would say are the biggest factors taking on a point of the market that nobody else is doing, taking on an existing part of the market and believing you can do it better, and the third variable of marketing and word of mouth. Those I would say, I would, I would say, <laughs> those I would say are the three best things. Those are the three things that are, I would say, the biggest variables. If you can lock down all three, or maybe just two, you don't have to, I mean, it's technically impossible to be both niched and a rival. So whichever route you went down in that triangle, you can certainly have a successful game. And on the subject of this, without getting too specific, and some of you who are already on the Discord server will probably know about this, I have my own plans for why this discussion might be more important in the future of the channel, let's just say. And although I'm not going to get into crazy specifics or anything set in stone or making promises or anything like that, suffice it to say that I'm already beginning certain inquiries into processes, processes, theorems, if you will, that might make this conversation a lot more valid. But we'll see. So, of course, down below, I'd love to hear your thoughts on what you think makes a racing game successful. Maybe more tangible stuff than what I talked about. Maybe more theoretical stuff, like I talked about. Either way, I'd love to hear your thoughts down below, and of course, until next time I'll see you then. But for now, as always, thanks for watching.